I'm Justin the Floor God, and welcome to another episode of the So Who's Up Next podcast, the show where I talk to my fellow artists about their process, inspirations, and creativity. Today's guest is someone who recently released an EP titled Obviously Icarus, a rambunctious, contemplative, and apocalyptic three-piece acoustic project that takes a deep dive into what it means to be human and what it means to be yourself. Alex of Arise Sir, what can you tell me about how you got the idea for Obviously Icarus? I had always wanted to do like like a home recorded acoustic thing and I just didn't have like the songs to do it. I didn't think I wrote Look to the Lights. I I started writing that I think February of last year. Oh wow. Um it's like a long time ago. I had like the guitar part, but it wasn't until maybe September last year that I f- wrote the lyrics. Mm. And the vocal melody. So still, you know, it's like a year old song by the time it's it was released. I put that together and then I had the verses for obviously Icarus done, but it was just kind of like an idea at that point. It wasn't until I finished Icarus that I was like, okay, I've got the songs I want to do. Yeah. And I had already talked about like tweeted out like, hey, I'm going to do two EPs mm-hmm. before I even had the songs I wanted to do. So yeah, then I, I wrote Gonna Die in about five minutes in April. Whoa. That's just, yeah, I'm sure you know some of those songs, just they'll just kind of, they're already done in your head, you know. For sure. You just put it out. So I, I wrote it in five minutes, recorded it 10 minutes immediately after, sent it to Kixie, and she did her magic. And then I finished Icarus in July, and two days later, I spent two days recording in a friend's basement my guitar and vocals, and then I sent it to Kixie, and gotcha. she did her her thing. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you've obviously, I mean, we've both worked with Kixie in the past, but for you, like, mm-hmm. what exactly is that like? Is it, I guess, more, you just kind of come up with stuff and send it her way, or is it like... She listens to it and says, okay, you need to like redo like half of this or whatever it is. Like what what exactly goes down between an Arise Sir slash Kixie uh, collab? Unlike songwriting I've done with other, it's not really even, we're not really even working on the songwriting. I think Kixie and I just trust each other enough to the point where it's like, if something needs to be said, then there's no hard feelings. And like the person who like has the critique is probably right. I did bass on her album that came out and there were a few things where I'd be like, maybe this, maybe that, but like not often. And it, she'd take it and um, she'd work with it for, I mean, for the bass, I, I didn't really, I kind of stayed in my own space cause I was just doing bass. Mm. But um, with Icarus, it's Kixie. Like all I did was I sent her the tracks and I told her any idea you have, like put it down and I'm going to love it. Yeah. And I did. Um, she didn't have any sort of feedback to give, although if she did, like, obviously I would have taken it, but yeah, working with Kixie, she is the most wonderful person to work with. I'm sure you, you can agree with that. Oh yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. yeah I'm, she, I'm just, it's cool to get like the inside scoop on like, I guess another interaction <laughs> with Kixie, yeah. you know, it's, it's super cool just to, just to listen. She also played like a huge role, not only in like the actual mixing and stuff, which we were talking earlier and, and I, I said like, I instantly knew it was a Kixie master, mm-hmm. you know, um, yeah. just cause she, she mixes, in my opinion, she mixes vocals like really low, you know? She does. Um, I actually told her to bring them up in some of the songs. Did she? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that, <that's laughs> I guess that, was, that was that low. <laughs> I think it was going to die. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, was like, bring the, I was like, bring the vocal up a little bit and then bring the actual master volume up a little bit on all the songs. Yeah. No, I mean, obviously, they're all super well done, super polished things. And I remember the first time listening through... I didn't realize that it was just voice and guitar the whole time. Like it took me, yeah. it took me until the next like run through to realize mm-hmm. there weren't any drums. Cause I, I, I've listened to your previous projects or previous project on, on Spotify, the something mm-hmm. about this needs to change, needs to be changed. And it's so loud, like in, in a good way, yeah. obviously, <laughs> but, but, but then you have like a contrast of like all this acoustic stuff. And you mentioned earlier, like you, you wanted to do just an acoustic thing. I don't know. Just for me, it was, it was a really different, thing to go into but at the same time it sounded full i think that was in large part because of all the layering you do oh yeah uh, with not just your voice yeah exactly like it was it was like a lot of you and then a lot of kixie and so i think i texted you earlier about like the the playfulness of some of the harmonies and stuff so Mm -hmm. when you're i guess in the booth you know because wait wait where, where do you record usually um i recorded 
the first EP in a studio, actually. Yeah. Um, the only time I, I've, anytime I demo, it's really just kind of like I set up wherever my mic is at the time. Hmm. But yeah, and then the Philly EP that's coming out in December, I also went to a studio for. I'm very not a uh, DIY. I will say for Icarus, I did. It was in a, f- a friend of mine. I went to his house because he has carpeted floors. He had a really like soundproofed carpeted room and it was just right there in the middle of it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like put a blanket over the window and you're good. Mm-hmm. So when, when you go about writing the actual songs, you have, you, I mean, to go to a studio and just bang it all out, you have to have all the songs already written and things. Yes. Um, but when you go to record, because granted, I've never been in a studio, so this could just be a dumb question, but is there anything you've ever found yourself changing on the fly where you're like, oh, I, I really thought this was going to work, but then it didn't, or, or you had to change something drastically at all? It goes, honestly, both for in-studio and out-of-studio. Mm-hmm. Um, I did a EP two years ago with my two friends. Uh, we, we had a band called A Healthy Alternative for Better Living. Oh, yeah, I, I remember I remember listening to some of that a while ago. And, like, there would even be lyrical ideas I'd change then. Um, I was a little too nervous to kind of go too overboard at that point. But mm-hmm. And then with Icarus, actually, the bridge, I, I had the instrumental for the bridge to look to the lights. But, like, as I was doing vocals, I got to it. I'm like, this needs a vocal part. And so I just, like, looked through my notes. I found all these wolves with wool around their waist part. Mm-hmm. And then I wrote um the second half of that bridge just on the spot wow and threw it in there and then even even the philly ep which we spent three or four months on pre-production which is just like we would demo and then we'd send it to the producer and he would give us notes Mm. about the songwriting and what this guitar could do and what this bass could do and he'd send it back and we'd re-demo and just keep going back and forth so we were like as on point as we could be even with three months of that there were still things as we were recording in the studio that we changed i think that in any recording process it's not done until it's done you know right right and you say you were working with a producer you're in a studio but do you know any like production yourself or or do you just do like all the like actual music part of the music pretty much just the music part like i i can kind of work my way around making it sound slightly better i guess but I'm, that's kind of even giving me more credit than i deserve gotcha let's talk about like the thematic ideas behind the ep so mm-hmm. obviously icarus at least when i read that before i even listened to the thing i was mm-hmm. like oh this is gonna be like some some sad boy shit you know what i mean like <laughs> here we go <laughs> um we're, we're gonna we're gonna be falling out of the sky you know mm-hmm. and, and we do in in the title track which i just want to go on record my favorite out of the three <laughs> just because it's so it's so fun but so depressing mm-hmm. at the same time like like I, I told you earlier like the the hook the chorus is so mm-hmm. catchy i want to know more about your your process and in, in writing that song like how how that came to be what inspired it it's a little tough to remember because it was so fragmented it took like a year to to finish it Hmm. i wrote the first verse i think the day that ginger by brockhampton came out or maybe a a day or two later i at least wrote the chord progression for it Hmm. but um yeah so i wrote that first verse i gotta actually hang on let me look at the lyrics so i can (laughs) remember what i'm talking about yeah you're all good so i had that first verse which is um keep all the lights on me as i toss and turn you never let me sleep another sheep to count these shepherds doubt and never trust in me i guess i feel uncertain i guess i'll have to wait and see if i pull back the curtain will there be anything left to believe that honest to god could have just been like a random like just like this is kind of how i'm feeling right now Mm. or but also a mix of like oh this next line would just sound cool oh okay you know what i mean as in like mm, yeah i'm gonna go with that it's it's really hard to remember because it's been so long since i've written that verse yeah yeah but i guess honestly i should i probably should have started by just kind of talking about the theme of the song anyways which um does i guess go in tandem with that sad boy kind of vibe you got from it which is more of just like uh I wrote a lot about a lot of the Philly EP that's coming out Mm -hmm. is also just kind of about like, not like a toxic relationship, I guess, and not even always a relationship in the sense of like a romantic interest, Mm -hmm. but just kind of like unhealthy relationships varying from romantic to, I guess, unrequited, 
even to uh, I have a song about like the obsession with celebrities and how that's unhealthy you know so it, it kind of varies all over this is more of that unrequited kind of one but I I twist it you know in the hook when my wings burn through I made your yours mine which is kind of like a being an asshole <laughs> yeah no I, I, I got you so yeah I guess it it just very fragmented came together. I wrote the second verse recently inspired by the first half of that verse is similar to gonna die, which is kind of me being pissed off at the world right now. Mm. Yeah. And how things are the line lock me in quarantine, then bury me when my pockets are clean. More of like an anti capitalist than a I'm so sad that this girl doesn't love me. Yeah. Kind of <laughs> <For line>. sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I I got you there. Um yeah, I guess it just kinda however I was feeling as I wrote whichever part came up, I wrote the bridge after I finished the hook and it just kind of turned into that sort of song, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's super cool. Cause even in my own process, like I I've been writing things very fragmented, you know, like Mm -hmm. I'll write a verse here and then I'll write a chorus there. But I, I remember um, when I was working on like earlier projects, it, it seemed for the lyrics to me and, and musical ideas as well, just mm -hmm. they would come easier. And I wonder if that's a, a part of like just knowing how to filter your ideas better. At least for me, now I know when like an idea won't pan out way faster than at any other time previous. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know, is it kind of like that for you? Or how do you kind of filter your ideas to, to know what's going to make the cut and what's not going to make the cut? It's probably honestly more of for me like just a instinctual thing mm. if i like write a lyric i can probably tell by right then if i'm gonna use it or not and then i just won't pursue it if i do pretty much any music part that i write with intention has a good chance of being used mm. i i don't have to filter as much because i don't think i probably don't create as much as you to be entirely honest oh i gotcha i'm not writing a whole lot so it's typically only like i'm writing when i'm feeling confident in what i'm gonna write yeah no i i totally relate to that because there's definitely with creativity and especially music i found like you got to ride those waves you know because that inspiration mm -hmm. isn't always there so when it is you know you capitalize on it obviously is there like a narrative that kind of ties all three of them together or are they more separate like little mini stories i guess there's like overarching themes i guess through all of them i think that there was i think that any time you could like sit down to write a song about one thing but like there's always going to be how you're feeling at that exact point in mm. that song in some way and so a lot of these songs have this kind of like oh the world's ending theme hidden in them except for gonna die which is just like the most upfront kind of way to do it because sure is you know the hook is we're all gonna die yeah like i said that icarus line about bury me when my pockets are clean and then even look to the lights that wolves around their waist still howling at the moon line is also kind of me being like man i really hate like ceos <laughs> like, I, I got you killing us please stop yeah obviously icarus is more about i guess like an anxiety i used to have that would make me super confident and asshole and mm -hmm. then look to the lights i'm bipolar too so i get more of the depressive than the manic so obviously icarus is more of that manic and yeah. then look to the lights is more about the depressive episodes but also like when i was first diagnosed I was diagnosed with depression, I think, when I was in seventh or eighth grade, and then bipolar two when I was a senior in high school. Hmm. And it was kind of like, I remember when I would tell people I was bipolar, you know, they're just like, no, you're not. Huh. You know, kind of like typical, like, oh, that's, you know, like, just do this, just do that, you're fine. Right, right. Which is where the hook comes from, which is like, you know, they're always questioning me, asking why you never look to the lights. Hmm. It's like, well, you know, you'd look to the lights if it was easy to. So yeah, look to the lights kind of is, is about that. But there is still those small lines about that kind of tie in more with gonna die. So yeah, not a very blatant narrative or overarching thing, but they're tucked in there. Yeah, no, I gotcha. So I definitely got like that sense of duality from all these songs um mm. just because the material or the i guess the actual content of what you're saying is apocalyptic is dark is very grim but at the same time the guitars and voice are so bright like your performance is just fun 
So was that like an intentional idea going into this or is that just a part of like how all these songs turned out? It's, I think a little bit of both. I think with Icarus, I kind of always write more like poppy, at least like upbeat and fast. I've always kind of got that upbeat and fun vibe that I, I want to do. So Icarus has that kind of upbeatness with the bounciness on, on the guitars. And then it's, I think the hook on Icarus is, is, one of the better ones I've done, if I can say that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, like, and it's like a hook, not just a chorus. And it didn't really, it's kind of just like if I have a guitar part and I tend to sway towards those bouncy, upbeat guitar parts, then I'm going to use it no matter what the lyrics are. I gotcha. Um, Gonna Die was intentional. I wanted to, I think it was even you that related it to the campfire, kind of like sitting yeah, around yeah. and hanging out, which was, you got it, you hit the nail on the head there. Because I was, this was, it was an April pandemic was like full swing. America was actually in lockdown. I hadn't seen my friends in like weeks. I was so bummed. Like it was my birthday. Like my birthday was that month. And like I couldn't hang out with my friends and, you know, bummed out because I couldn't see anyone. And that was the day the quotes, like people are going to have to die for the economy to live were being thrown around. And I was like, what the, like, I was like, what the hell? Yeah. And I, I don't ever get like political, polit politically charged in my songs. It's always more personal, but like that one, it kind of, it was more personal. Like it was still kind of personal, but it was more about what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and I wrote it like a campfire song because I wanted to, I had that feeling of wanting to be with my friends and like hang out with people and be social. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that it would be a funny kind of dichotomy to have a song about everyone dying be incredibly bonfire, cheery, right. sing song. Yeah, let's celebrate the end of the world. <laughs> exactly. I mean, yeah. you even have like the claps thrown in there. And yeah, I just thought it'd be really funny and it turned out good. Yeah. So Gonna Die was on purpose. Icarus just kind of turned out that way. And then Look to the Lights. I mean, that's that's a slower one anyways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, for sure. Can we talk about the Philly EP? That is obviously louder. <laughs> You're doing a lot more yeah. on this next one. Um, mm -hmm. Also, thank you for letting me listen to it early. It's it's all bangers, all bangers. Um, thank you. So <laughs> what I guess was different in, in the, the making of this next EP uh, compared to obviously Icarus. Icarus was recorded in seven hours over the course of two days. Wow. And it was very rough. Like I, I intended for everything to be really rough and not sound like I was trying so hard because I wasn't trying that hard. Okay. You know, I sat down, I would do three or four takes on a guitar for each song. And then I do three or four takes for every vocal part. Hmm. And like, that's it. If every single take I was flat on a note, whatever, like leave it in. Interesting. Um, so you could even, I'm not going to point them out, but there are still things on the actual EP that, would, that came out that's still off. You know, if like a classically trained composer heard it, he'd be like, I don't want to hear this ever again in my life huh. because I heard this very, very tiny detail where like this note that was harmonizing with this note is two semitones off. Uh yeah, um, I gotcha. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I th I do I think Kixie tuned them up if where they needed to be, but still like it's more of just the, the actual process of recording that I wanted to be rough. Yeah. No, and, I got gotcha. quick and just like like you know, you light a match and it's gone kind of thing. Interesting. Philly everything was incredibly deliberate and like planned out i said we did you know three or four months of pre-production yeah yeah and it was like the producer would point out things that were like super super specific mm. um but like you listen to it, it's like oh yeah that actually makes sense there's um this isn't gonna make sense to anyone but you but in um the who i was demo mm. there's like this pre-chorus where it's just the bass and vocals mm. and I played the bass part that I had written, which was pretty much exactly what it is in the recording part. But the last three notes, he's like, no, actually play those three notes following the same rhythm that the vocal melody is playing. Mm. And it's like something very specific like that, you know, rather than me just doing like three quarter notes, I actually turned into like a half note, two eighth note kind of thing. Oh, I gotcha. And that, like, that did a lot more than you'd think it would because it supported the vocal and it kind of kept it tight. 
you know, rather than just like the bass is playing whatever and the vocal is doing whatever over it, they're actually like, it's ex- they're, they're trying to work together, mm-hmm. which is another case of that nothing's done until it's done. I was talking about that's really the biggest difference, I think, is everything with Philly was deliberate. It took easily multiple days of hours between mm-hmm. all of us. I mean, even just recording it, we were there for eight days. We spent eight to 10 hours every day doing it. That's insane. But yeah, that was rough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to I say mean, the least. It, it turned out, or well, I mean, they're not done, done, but it 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 turned out really, really nicely. I think, from what I've heard. Um, yeah, the production on it's insane. It's so tight. Like the, I don't know. It was just. It definitely came off as more intentional. Granted, I feel like that's because there are all these other elements working. Whereas in Icarus, you you just have like your voice, the occasional clap, and then like kixie you know what i mean oh yeah, and yeah. Also the guitars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on whole it definitely came across as more intentional but icarus despite its minimalism like I-, I thought it was really really solid production and you were saying how you didn't mind really if your voice was off or whatnot but it definitely sounded like your most polished work yet at least to me because when when i was listening to your other ep the something about this needs to be changed it's not so much the ideas that were different sonically for me it was it was more like the actual performance and and the life behind them if that makes Mm -hmm. sense and i don't want to sound like too pretentious uh, but (laughs) it sounds like you definitely were more intentional whether you wanted to be or not in icarus and because your voice was on point and i feel like that may have just also come with you know practice and time as well Mm -hmm. if you could tell me what changed in in your process about how you record voice or how you practice voice from that first spotify ep there's something about this needs to be changed compared to icarus and then also the philly ep i think that the big thing is just kind of time and experience and practice Mm -hmm. um because i did something about this needs to be changed i recorded it january of 2019 Mm -hmm. that was also only six months after I recorded the Half Bowl EP, which was the very first time I was in the studio. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, six months is a very short amount of time to do that. And I hadn't really had enough time, I think, to grow and understand what I was doing with my voice. I was just kind of like, all right, these songs are supposed to be loud and fast. I'm just going to like go for it. I also had very limited time for something about this needs to be changed. I was the only one beside like... I did most of the instruments, uh, recorded and wrote most of the instruments. I had a friend do guitar on a track, another friend do guitar on another track, someone do drums. Some Two people did drums, one on No Friends, one on Backwoods. Hmm. And then I did everything else. Or actually, I also had someone do the electronic drums and hmm. synths on Simple Minded. But besides that, so I, you know, I wrote and recorded like 90% yeah. of what was on that EP. And I was very like draining. So by the time we got to vocals, I was driving 45 minutes to the studio and back every day, Mm -hmm. spending eight to 10 hours stressing about if we had enough time to get it done. And then by the time I got to vocals, I'm just like exhausted already. I recorded Icarus after we recorded in Philly. So by the time I got to Philly, I learned a lot about what goes on in recording, Mm -hmm. especially like in a studio, but really just like a lot of general stuff. So I used a lot of that knowledge in recording Icarus. And there was a lot that I didn't know about singing that I found out when we did the Philly EP. Um, Casey, who produced it, he was the producer, engineer, co-song. He was like all over the place. He's like giving me vocal lessons as I'm tracking vocals for the Philly EP, this, this, and that. And I was slowly figuring it out then. And then I kind of had time to sit on it after we recorded and like it all kind of clicked in my head, which I then translated into the recording of Icarus. And I totally can relate to that. Like, I mean, not the being in the studio parts, but um, the just working through the process and then essentially like all of your past works obviously influence your your style and, and process moving forward and things. But yeah, it's, it's just cool to see how, how you've changed as an individual. And one of those changes that I, I noticed on Icarus was just how short the songs were compared to um, previous releases and things like that. So what was going through your mind when thinking of the length of the EP being only three tracks? Granted, EPs are really short anyway, so ultimately it doesn't really matter, but I- I'm just curious as to like um, whether you knew it was gonna be three tracks or-, or whatnot, and then also like the length of the tracks being shorter compared to something like Backwoods. Yeah, for the length, honestly, that was just kind of something I had to learn as a songwriter, is like learning what doesn't need to be in a song. on the 
a half full EP, I think our shortest song was like four minutes long. Something about this needs to be changed has like two minutes that are, th or two songs are like three, three and a half minutes. It's got the instrumental track, which is like two minutes, but then balanced is like four minutes. Mm -hmm. Simple minded is five and backwards is eight. And I went to this songwriting workshop at NYU last year mm -hmm. that taught me a lot about like streamlining what you're trying to do. And so, yeah, it was just kind of, it took me a, a while to understand that not every idea needs to be doubled. Not every idea needs to even be in that specific song. You know, I could have an idea that like I really love, but the song I put it in wasn't the right one. Mm -hmm. And like this song, a song I could have written a month later would have been perfect for it. So yeah, it's just kind of a process between EP1 and EP2 of like, okay, I don't need to spend so much time. Like not everyone's going to care about this cool arpeggio part I've got. Right. And it's not even helping the song. You know, I'm all about what they really drilled into us at that workshop was like serve the song. Mm. So if I've got a part that I love, but I know it's not going to help the song, then I'm not going to use it. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's a perfect mindset going into that because I, I think very much the same way when I go to make my tracks. It's like I, I have to spend time getting to know the song and then really listen to what it needs and respond to those needs rather than imposing it on them, you know? Exactly. So, yeah, that, that's that's pretty cool. I wish I had a workshop. That'd be pretty cool. But. <laughs> Um, but yeah, oh, you also mentioned like streamlining the the tracks, which obviously reduces the the actual runtime of them. Was marketing at all in your mind, given like the current landscape of how fast people move on from one thing to the next, and and how short people's attention spans are right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that was another thing that they mentioned at that workshop. Is like, I mean, you know, you can by now for many years, most songs have been two and a half, three minutes on mm -hmm. the radio. No one wants, like, everyone wants to get to the chorus. Yeah. Which, with Gonna Die and Icarus, I kind of, I thought about, but also at the same time, it just kind of happened that way anyways. Mm -hmm. Gonna Die has that short pre-chorus, but besides that, there's not even a bridge mm -hmm. in that song. But that was just because it didn't need a bridge, at least in my head. You know, I, I do the intro, and then first verse, pre-chorus, by the time you get to the chorus, you're like a minute in. One of the Philly songs, Quiet, is like two and a half minutes it's under three minutes and you get through the chorus before a minute passes and that one was definitely written with the intention of like okay like it's a fast song but also i don't need to have 16 lines of a verse just like i've got four lines and i'm good just get through it so it's just it's a mix of like okay i want people to listen to it because anyone that puts music out wants people to listen to it of if course. they say they don't they're, they're lying <laughs> Um, but also just like, I even kind of got tired of writing a song that's four minutes. It's really, I mean, look to the lights is four and a half minutes, but I feel like I'm always doing something in it. Simple minded, for example, is five minutes. I could have easily cut it to like four at least maybe even three and a half. And then backwards, the demo was like six minutes. I just played it way too slow in the recording. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was just like, God, like. I'm tired of this. I don't even think I have the creative energy to write another five minute song anymore. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I totally relate to that because that, that's part of, uh, dude, honestly, the more we talk, the more like alike we become, I feel, because in my own process, it's, it's very similar of, of a mindset. Like, I get bored really fast of what I'm making, like the, the new stuff that, that's, that's in the works right now very short songs you know i think just one of them crosses that three minute mark and they're all very like high energy fast tempo let's get to the chorus and leave you know like and i i think that it's also just a reflection of like pop music you know like earlier you mentioned how um you were kind of going more in a pop direction but then not really pop but like proper um mm -hmm. but in, in in the way that you're, you're describing like the length of the actual tracks and the structure of them especially I feel reflects like a like a pop dominated music scene imposing mm -hmm. its will on every genre under the sun now. So Yeah. Yeah, um, I can agree with that. But yeah, I don't know. Do you think it's like a bad thing? Cause I feel I like brushed up on the like the song Backwoods, right? That mm -hmm. song is awesome. Its length is I think is perfect, especially because you have like a great sense of like ebb and flow on that track. Like you know where the high points are, you know where the low points are, and you play to those strengths, you know. But then the music industry, I guess, is cranking out all these shorter songs. So do you think we're like missing out on opportunities to experience music like that? Or do you think it's better with like a faster paced environment reflecting the also 
fast music now we all have. I wouldn't say that it's necessarily like limiting anything, mm-hmm. either limiting creativity or limiting anyone's ability or desire to listen to anything longer than three minutes. If you look at like Bohemian Rhapsody, that song is still played all the time and it's like four, four and a half minutes long, I think. And it's not really a pop song at all. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not until you get into the more rock anthem part that it gets catchy. Everything else before it is, I don't know, what what, would that, what is that classical something? Yeah. (laughs) Sure. I don't know. I'm not a, yeah. I think it's really just everything's following, not necessarily the will of the music, but the will of what the people actually want to listen to. If people actually want to listen to a song that's four minutes, but everyone loves and like, everyone's going to love it and it's going to be played. If a song is three minutes and everyone loves it, then that's the thing. And I think it's just music following the trends of what people like rather than a bunch of suits at Sony. Like, okay, we want two and a half minute songs because, and that's going to be the norm because we say so. But that's not to say I totally disagree or totally deny that it has an effect on an actual artist's creativity. Mm -hmm. But I think that that's more the artist should just not worry about it. Yeah, no, I I, I got you. Just like make what you're going to make anyway. Yeah, just like go for it. And the right people that want to listen to it are going to find it. And I I think we can see that a lot on uh, like Kixie stuff too. Like she's got some beat switches on her new album. It definitely works to keep the interest. Yeah. Um, But yeah, she also just makes what she's going to make anyway, which uh, I think is also pretty cool. Yeah, I guess the only other thing I wanted to really get into, and it's kind of a minor thing, is the album art um, or the cover art of the EP. Mm-hmm. Uh, where'd that come from? Like, did you make it or did you have an idea of it? Who made it? Um, I guess just what, what was the process? Uh, yeah, that is actually one of my good friends. Um, Justin Cuneo designed that. Uh, his Twitter is space colors, space C-L-R-S. He is amazing at art as you can just tell by the cover. Yeah. All I did, and it's the same thing I did with the Something About This Needs to Be Changed art, uh, which was made by Who Comes Here Comes the Art, who I, I found him online. But all I did for both of those was I sent them the tracks and the general themes, and I was like, make whatever. Yeah. Um, the only stipulation I had with Justin for the Icarus art is, um, obviously, I've got these second EP out already, and I've got the third EP coming. Every single one of them has a circle on it which is like it it's not a big thing i just thought it'd be cool if there was kind of like some sort of motif between all three of the eps because i'm not going to do another ep for a while so there's that big circle on the something about this needs to be changed art you know with all like the blobs in it Mm -hmm. and then i we actually just bought the art for ep3 Mm -hmm. uh which also had a big circle on it and so i just told justin like do whatever you want to do all you need to do is have a circle and i think he said he found that kind of like sketched circle idea with like the broken lines and it's like very rough he saw that on some art from like with like a different shape or something and then he just used a free font called kids i think is what it was called and then obviously the icarus aspect is the man in the middle falling he actually had it black with the circle being white but i thought that looked a little too like dark for Mm. what the x for what the ep is yeah Uh, so we just inverted it to the white with the black and i think it came out nice no i really like that and earlier um you mentioned being bipolar and so i'm just curious because we we were talking earlier about how like the depressive side really kind of comes through in this last ep something about this needs to be changed isn't necessarily like the happiest group of songs either you know so um i was just wondering like when, if ever, um, you've used mania to your advantage to create something with more of like a, an upbeat sense, what's that look like? It doesn't exactly work in that way. That this is just an opportunity, I guess, to to learn about it because I think that bipolar does have that stigma around it of like, oh, you know. Uh, I actually, I was, one of my guitar teachers, I saw him around the time I was diagnosed. It had been a year or so since I seen him, mm-hmm. and I told him I was bipolar. And he's like, oh, that's great. Like, don't take your pills because you're going to make some sick music. Oh, no. <laughs> I can't, I couldn't tell if he was joking or not. He seemed dead serious though. So, but either way, I'm by being bipolar too. I don't, I don't get the mania that's like stereotypical. Gotcha. I get a little bit, but it's only for like an hour. Hmm. Maybe that's what separates bipolar one from bipolar two. Bipolar one is what everyone thinks of. Bipolar two oh, is okay. Just, I see you. 
I low, gotcha. low lows with some high, it's called hypomania. I don't, I've never really like used either quote unquote to my advantage. Mm. Um, it's just kind of like about it. I think I actually, I had a, I had a psychology lecture in my year at Sarah Lawrence where we talked about that kind of tortured artist stereotype, I guess. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's some sort of relation. I think it was like people that have depression or are depressed always think very introspectively. So just mm-hmm. thinking about themselves all the time. And I think that mixed with a lot of depression, a lot of people that are depressed will just kind of like hang out and do a lot of nothing because they just it's like hard to do anything. So I think in that time they're thinking introspectively which then leads to just, you know, you think if you it, all writing music or making art is is just thinking and then your hands move and your thought is physical. Mm-hmm. Um so I think it's just when you're depressed and you're sitting there doing nothing but thinking to yourself, you're getting the ideas. And like, that's it. But I don't think that, yeah, I'm like very staunch about the tortured artist doesn't exist. It's not a real thing. Mm -hmm. You can make whatever art, whatever music you want to make, no matter what your mental state is. Oh, for sure. You know, like I haven't had a manic or a depressive episode in like two years. Gotcha. I don't even know if I'm bipolar anymore, (laughs) you know, but I'm still able and I'm still writing these songs about things that are bothering me. Mm-hmm. Or things that I don't like, things that I've experienced but haven't felt like I've kind of thought through. I guess I think mm-hmm. it's just, it's safe to bet that most people that make music, it's like therapeutic to them. It's more of like a diary. You know, you're like just more. It's like a meditation. You're meditating on something that's been weighing on you. Some of those Icarus songs, the only one that was kind of like immediate was gonna die. I just wrote that as like a reaction to what was going on around me at the time, but. The title track and look to the lights are about things and about people that I haven't felt or talked to in years, but have just been like things that I've thought about in those years that I've never really like made sense of or tried to make sense of. Mm. And it's more me trying to make sense of it. So it's like the music is almost a, a way of thinking through these ideas more. Yeah, exactly. It's pretty much a therapy session with myself. Of yeah, just like, I got you talking it out and then it's like oh maybe like this way i've been feeling makes sense but now that i've written it and it's you know it's on paper mm-hmm. i can finally like move past and i don't have to worry about it anymore it's also i feel like a good form of record keeping you know even if like mm-hmm. listeners don't know exactly the context or the stories behind every individual thing you know i don't know about you but i listen to my old stuff like all the time and it's not like in a narcissistic way it's mm-hmm. more of like okay, what have I learned and what can I take away from these ideas I thought I could execute and then didn't or like, I don't know, it's just more like troubleshooting to keep that conversation going with myself through my works, if that makes sense. For no, for sure. Yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I, I feel like that's, that's a good place to end. Is there any like advice you could give to people that are wanting to kind of break into the space of music, either for the first time or for the next time? What would you say to them? God, I guess... If you're just starting, don't be afraid to suck. That's like, you know, very cliche advice, but it's true. I can't remember. I started writing lyrics four or five years ago, and I'm so glad I deleted them. Mm. Those lyrics that I wrote, because even lyrics I've written like a month ago, if I even have, I don't know, lyrics I've written in the past year, I'll still look at and be like, that's really bad. But out of writing the really bad stuff, I I get some, some good some good lines. And then I guess anyone that's been doing it for a while, I wouldn't say I've been doing it long enough to give amazing advice. If you like putting music out, don't be discouraged, I guess, if you don't get the reception you were looking for, because it's not going to come for some time. Chances are, you know, this is the end of the Arise Sir interview on the So Who's Up Next podcast. Arise Sir and the Obviously Icarus EP is out on Spotify, Apple Music, and other major streaming platforms. Make sure to listen to this one because it's honestly been one of my favorite projects the entire year. You can follow our show and Arise Sir by hitting the links to our socials in the description below. Be sure to stick around because next time I'll be having a conversation with Louis Jacobs, a London native who's getting ready to drop his new album before they find us. All this and much, much more coming very, very soon. Thanks for listening and I'll talk to you again soon.